Satan will throw arrows at you, just like he did Job. Job is doing his stuff, doing his business, and all of a sudden, bam, there's Satan. When all of a sudden you are giving to God, but all of a sudden stuff just start breaking at the house. The so Bible says Satan wants to come as I tear stuff down. He wants to devour you in discouragement. Satan got all kinds of schemes, not just one scheme, the scheme of discouragement. He wants to devour you. He wants to shift you like wheat. He's going to heaven day and night because he wants to tear you up with anxiety and worry. He wants to create fear. He's got a long list that Satan tries to do to us. I'm always excited about what this ministry means to many people. It's a challenge and sometimes it can be difficult, but what it does for your life is the energy. And I pray that more of you would write in, talk to us about what's going on or share the word about this ministry and how it touches your life each Sunday morning at six o'clock. And you would also uh, consider looking into participating and coming by and visit 7350 TC Jester at Living Word Fellowship Church. Yes, we are a church committed to the scriptures. We are a church committed to see you grow, but that is not going to hurt you. It's going to bless your life in the long run. And it's a pleasure serving you. So we pray that you would stay tuned and become involved in the word of God integrating into your life for the glory of God and for the blessing it can be to your soul and your spirit and your family. Thanks for listening. Several years ago, probably about seven years ago, God convicted me that I seldom preach on this issue. And it basically had a lot of things to do with people who came here hurt, broken, from experiences in churches and experiences with pastors. And so as a result of that, I wanted to heal their hearts before I focus on anything else. But God convicted me, and the minute that he did that, uh, and it started pastoring, the church took a turn in a different direction. Because pastoring and preaching are two different things. You can be a preacher. The Bible says how sweet are the preachers when they bring good news. A preacher is not necessarily a pastor. A preacher in the Bible is the word evangelizo, meaning it's a person who talks about the gospel. That's what the word means in the Greek text. It is a messenger. That's a person that's different. That's why they call this the pulpit. It is a person that pulls you from the pit. So the person that is an evangelizos, a person who's a preacher, is not necessarily a pastor. Those are two different things. A person could be a man, but it don't make them a husband. A person could be a woman, but that don't make them a wife. They, they can be a person who can have a job, but it don't necessarily mean that they can be a father and that raising that child and nurturing that child and managing a home and taking care of the issues of marriage and raising their wife up to a radiant church. That's being a man that is no longer just a man. That's a man that is a shepherd in his home. Those are two different things. That's why there are lots of babies, but not a lot of fathers. There's a lot of babies, not a lot of mothers. Because those are two different things. You can hire a person with a degree. They don't mean they can do the work. Those are two different things. That's a person that's a student and a person that's a worker. Those are two different things. A person could be a preacher, but not a pastor. Those are two different things. A person could be a pastor, not a church planter. Those are two different things. So when we come to Scripture... The Bible has been working to develop you. It's not about the pastor. I think the person that I miss a whole lot just about every day is my mom. Because she would always say, all the time, that a good shepherd is a person who shepherds people from their heart, not from their head. She raised her children that way. Because where God wants to take you 
is to build you into his house so that his house are several houses walking around on the street. And when all those little houses come together, it makes a nation on Sunday morning. That's what he's trying to do. He's not trying to just church you and preach to you and make you come and just give and all these different things. God wants for you to become what he created you to be. Let's look at chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians. What God wants for you, like a parent who has a child, want the child to become their best. That's why they sacrifice so much. They don't sacrifice so the child just grow up and get out the house because then they end up taking the house. What I mean by that is they grow up and go outside the house, but they commit so many crimes you got to mortgage the house. A person who raises the child, that person makes more sacrifices, go through more pain than anybody else because the child is born in sin, shaped in iniquity with foolishness in their hearts. To take that child and make them what God wants them to be is a lot of work. And if you cannot work for something that you're not willing to sacrifice for. No, nobody has, does good on their job if they don't sacrifice to do a good job. They may come in earlier, stay later. They are working hard to make that job work. That's a person that does well at their job. But a person who just shows up, does their job, look at the clock and get out, that person tends to stay stuck. The person who sacrifices to prepare themselves and maybe take work home, that person does that. So the Bible is saying, I found you lost in sin, shaped in iniquity, not different than a child being born in a house. I found you this way. I saved you into a brand new creation, but you have to work it out in fear and trembling. It just doesn't get saved and bam, there it is. A person could be saved in Ephesians, and the Bible would say they could still live in the old man in Ephesians chapter 4. They could still have the same attitude, the same personality traits, the same frustrations, same attitude about things, even though they're saved. So the Bible says that's a working out. And that's why he says, I'm giving you everything to get you there. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings. He's not trying to give us a little bit. He wants to give us everything so we have everything to work it out. Then he says in verse 13, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, having also believed. That's why I like the word believers. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm, I'm going to not just put the Holy Spirit in you. I'm going to make sure he stays there because I came to develop him. In John chapter 14, verse 16, he says, this is what I came to provide you. Help the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one who transforms you. He is the one who builds you. A pastor can't do that. He could teach all day long and a person still remain the same. Because the person has to take what is inside of them and work it out. And I'm going to give you everything you need for life and godliness. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to make sure that when you show up in heaven, you can't tell me any excuse as to why you couldn't become all I developed you to be. You will have no excuse. John chapter 14 verse 16, he says, I will give the Father... And he will give you another help. I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another helper that he may be with you. He comes to help you forever. I sealed him in you forever. That's why you can't lose your salvation because he's sealed forever. But he is your helper. In other words, I can't work out this gift of salvation unless I get help. As a husband, I can't be what I need to be without help. So the Bible is saying, I can't be what God wants me to be without help. A child can't be what they need to be without help. The person cannot be spiritually developed without help. That's why I gave you pastors. In other words, a pastor is not something a pulpit committee come together and do like it's some job in the secular world. A pastor is somebody that was spiritually given to a congregation and it was somebody that God designed to do exactly what he needed to do because it's a gift from the Holy Spirit to be a pastor. Because the person who he is going to lead this process with that is the helper who is the helper attached to the truth that the Bible is saying will guide us into light that will provide us the life and life abundantly that God came to give us is a process of a shepherd. Shepherding is no joke. 
It is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. In verse 17, he says, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. That's why people, when they become worldly, they don't like teaching churches. I want you to tickle my ass, tell me what I want to hear, get me happy, and send me home. But the Bible says, no, he came, and I, will, I, want, to, I want you to stick with me. I want you to see how this works, because in the bodybuilding process of developing a church, you have to develop healthy people. You can't have a healthy church without healthy people. You can't have a healthy marriage without healthy people. You can't have a healthy family without healthy leaders in the home. You can't have it. You can put the television set in there. You could put the beautiful home in a beautiful neighborhood. You could develop the nicest car, the best kids with the clothes on, and the end of the day you still could raise a fool and because you have to have healthy children it has to be in a healthy home you can't have a healthy church if people are not willing to be healthy and the job of a pastor is to make people healthy is to grow them up the way God sees them as being not the way the world sees it not the way the world has designed it the way God sees it and the only way to do that is to make sure that people are attached to the helper and the helper is committed to the truth which is the Word of God and what is the preacher supposed to preach the truth look at first Timothy chapter 4 that's why in this position he calls the person a pastor teacher not a pastor preacher the reason why he calls him a pastor teacher is because the word in Greek, the dasko, means to shape the will of the person to go in the direction that they wouldn't otherwise want to go. So the person, a preacher, just brings them to Christ. A pastor has to shape them to the character of Christ. That is a different animal altogether. And the Bible is saying that when a person is a pastor, the job of the pastor is to shape the life of the person to go in the direction of the teacher, Jesus the Christ. That's why it is a pastor teacher, not a pastor preacher. Because you're trying to guide people to the truth. He's saying that in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, in the last days, they don't want to hear it. They get mad and they walk out. They don't want to hear it, Paul. So I'm not surprised when we have struggles. But when it's attached to doing this word, I'll take it any day. You'll never discourage me on that. Look at verse 11, because the Bible's going to tell me I have to be a soldier. There's times when you have to be a soldier. Look at verse 11. Prescribe and teach these things. Prescribe and teach them. Why? He's a pastor teacher. But he would tell him to preach. There's times when you got to preach the gospel. Look at chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 2. Not until the end of his letters to Timothy, he tells him to preach. Before then, teach, teach, teach. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Why? Reprove, rebuke, exalt. The word of God is something you endure. And the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want it. Make me happy. Make me jump up and down. But don't be telling me what to do. They, by wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves. They will accumulate for themselves in accordance to their own desires. He says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Preserve in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation. You get the salvation working out of people, both for yourself and for those who hear you. Not everybody going to hear you. Not everybody hearing the Bible means people who listen with a heart to go do it. Not everybody going to do that. But you must still let it be something you live by and teaching you are committed to because if you don't, what God saved people to become, they will not become. They will not become mature and developed in Christ. Because as you teach it, that will ensure salvation for them. If you don't teach it, salvation will not come. Meaning the deliverance from this sin nature, functionally, practically, will not happen. They'll be saved, but it wouldn't come out of them. You have to teach it to get it out of them. You have to shape their will to go in this direction. And when people don't want to hear it, they sometimes put up a fight. So what? Be a soldier. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be a soldier. 
Find some faithful men who are able to teach others. They look at verse 3, then he says in verse 3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in affairs of everyday life. So that he may please the one who's enlisted as a soldier. This is what many pastors use sometimes to get money out your pocket for themselves. Because technically, the pastor should not have to worry about nothing financially. That's what the priests were like. The priests didn't have to worry about what they're eating. Didn't have to worry about what they wear. They had to worry about nothing. They just did the work of ministry. That's why I tell friends all the time, y'all got a verse, you just exploit it. And 2 Peter takes place, take care of those who exploit it. Ezekiel 34 takes care of that. God going to whip the stuffings out of them. He ain't playing. Look at verse 5. For if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. You got to stick with the rules. It's a farming job. You got to plant and develop people and nurture people. That's why there's life application, discipleship. You're a farmer. Is a hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive the share of the crops. Yes. Take care of that farmer. I just don't do those things, but it's not, a, it's not in the Bible. So he gets about doing ministry. Consider what I say for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Why he's saying everything? Look at verse 16 says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. Is it probably for preaching? For teaching. Why? It's a pastor teacher. Shape the will of the people to go in the direction they don't otherwise want to go. They don't want to go here. When it makes them mad, they get up and do what they're going to do. So what? Those who want to hear it, those who have a heart to listen, they will be there. So focus on that. Because it's a word that is going to reprove people. It's going to correct people. It's going to train them in righteousness. There's nothing fun about it. It's not. Look at verse 17. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You never want your pastor out of the scriptures because then he can't tell you how to do good works. Look at chapter 4 of Ephesians. So God gave you pastor teachers. He gave them to you. It is the worst time in a preacher's life is when he decides to be a pastor. Worse. Anytime you decide you're going to lead people and guide them in a direction. Different. When you're preaching, just dress up, preach, let everybody do what they want to do and go home. Everybody happy. Till they get mad at each other, whoever develops the powerhouse in the church, whoever becomes the strongest powerhouse in the church, then they get mad at that person. And the pastor just calms everybody down. Keep going. I ain't going to do that. Because one day by and by when the morning comes, there's a crown that a pastor would wear or he will not wear. Y'all ain't taking that crown off my head. <laughs> Look at verse 11 of chapter 4. He says this, he says, and he gave, he gave apostles. We talked about that last week, that they laid the foundation for the church. How did they lay the foundation? We talked about it last week in John chapter 17, verse 20. They laid the foundation. Christ is the foundation. They laid it. How they laid it is that they made sure that the word of God was completely written, completely set out, so that when the pastor now has to build on it, he is building on what equips him for every good work. And he builds on what... Teaching takes place to shape the lives of the people in the direction they need to go in. So the Bible is saying, since the foundation is laid, now you can have a bodybuilder. And a bodybuilder is that pastor teacher. And here's the two main reasons why you have a pastor teacher. There are two main reasons. Two main reasons. There's some other reasons we find out in verse 13. But the two main reasons we'll find out in verse, in verse 12. He uses this word for. This preposition for, in, a, in a Greek it means this is the reason. It's a short way of saying here is the reason. He's saying here is the reason. It's for the equipping of the saints. Notice he didn't say the equipping of those who are saved. He said the equipping of the saints. And everybody's open up for this. That's why Jesus Christ could come smack dab in Jerusalem and only find 11 disciples. How could you come? In Jerusalem, be Jesus the Christ. You're healing people, born blind, 
raising people dead for days. You are literally taking five barley loaves and two tuna fish and making a sandwich to feed 10 to 12,000 people. But at the end of your journey, you only have one disciple at the cross. How could that be? He says, for the equipping of the saints. How do you equip them? Yes, it's mending broken bones, but it's more than that. More than that. Yes, people come broken. Job of a pastor is especially when it's a very serious issue, he got to jump in. Jump in. I work hard at that. Sometimes too hard. Get in trouble at home. For the equipping of the saints. That's why I got to learn my balance. It's my weakness. I learn my balance. On one hand, you have a mother say, serve from your heart. On the other hand, you have to be a husband and a man. It's a balance, constant balance. That's my fight. So it's for the equipping of the saints. What does he mean? When you go to chapter 6 of Ephesians, equipping is to have yourself fully armored. It's not just restoring broken bones, which we do. Counseling ministry, life application, outreach center, drug ministry, all this other stuff. So you have all of these things. Yes, we do that. Living Word is going to do that. Still fighting to get the modular building here to take care of people who are not clothed. Why? Because he said so in Matthew chapter 25. Clothe the naked. Take care of the hungry. Go to the prison. So we have people going to the prisons. This is what he said do. Take care of the broken. We're going to do that. Done. But it's also you have to equip the saints. So he's taking care of broken people and people that want to grow. Who are these saints? These are people who put on the armor. They want to know about the armor. Because why? The greatest enemy to all of this is Satan. Satan doesn't want to see the church be successful. He hates seeing the church be successful. Satan wants to tear it up. He's divisive. Satan wants to devour people. He wants to see people fight one another. You don't struggle against flesh and blood. You struggle against principalities and powers. So because Paul knows that a healthy church doesn't remove them from the war with the flesh, from the war with Satan, he talks about the flesh in chapter 4. Put off the old man. But when you put on the new man, there's another man standing there named Satan. And you have to be equipped for him. You have to be equipped for him. And that's why he's talking about equipment in chapter 6. Therefore, take up verse 13, take up the full armor. The pastor must teach you how to put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's all there. How to put on the belt of truth. How to wear the shoes of peace. How to get the shield of faith. How do you take care of the flaming arrows of the evil one? Verse 16. How do you get these flaming arrows from constantly getting to you? You always know when Satan is out there doing stuff is because you could be at work doing what you're supposed to do and all of a sudden somebody hates you. That's Satan. He ain't did nothing. All you have to do is smile. Oh, she smile all the time. They, they, you know somebody else hates you. The Bible says when stuff like that happens, it's just Satan. Satan will throw arrows at you just like he did Job. Job is doing his stuff, doing his business, and all of a sudden, bam, there's Satan. When all of a sudden you are giving to God, but all of a sudden stuff just start breaking at the house. So the Bible says Satan wants to come and start tearing stuff down. He wants to devour you in discouragement. Satan got all kind of schemes, not just one scheme, the scheme of discouragement. He wants to devour you. He wants to shift you like wheat. He's going to heaven day and night because he wants to tear you up with anxiety and worry. He wants to create fear. He's got a long list that Satan tries to do to us. And the person could be a saint willing to walk with God. And now they've gotten rid of the old man, put on the new man. But guess what? Satan says, oh, you think you all that? Let me show you something. So the pastor has to now equip them. How is he equipping them? With the very teaching he's giving to them. Because the Bible is saying that it's righteousness. What is righteousness? Teach them how to live right. How do you do that? The dasco. Teach them how to live right. Faith. Faith is when we apply what we know. We cannot resist Satan without the church having a pastor teacher. It's not a big head thing. I don't know why we go there. I don't know why we go there. It is the hardest job. And sometimes I wish you could see. That's why he puts it together. It is pastor. He's a shepherd. You ever study a shepherd? It is the nastiest job. 
That's why the Egyptians did not like shepherds. They stink. You out in the field day and night taking care of sheep. You don't get to take a bath every day. Then you take your clothes and you put it up in the sheep's nostrils to clean it out. Why do you do that? Because they get gnats in their nose. And the gnats will fly around in their nose and they would send the sheep crazy. And the sheep would just go crazy and fall over. And then you have to shave the wool off the sheep because when the wool gets piled on the sheep, they just sit on the grass and die. Sheep can't defend themselves. That's why he's telling us, be equipped. Put on me. Sheep, wolves are coming, they can't even run fast. They can't run fast more than more animals that are out hunting. A sheep can't run past them. Sheep is one of the slowest animals out in the field. So they're susceptible to any animal that is there to devour them. That's why the Bible says Satan came to devour. Why? We can't run fast. So we could never outrun Satan. I was watching the news and they said there's no way a commercial jet could outrun a missile. Because a missile is going at 2,000 miles an hour and the fastest speed a commercial jet could go is 700. So the minute somebody shoots at a, at a commercial jet, it's over. A warplane can try to get up to mock speed or something like that and try to avoid it. But a commercial jet, it's over. We are like a commercial jet when Satan shoots darts. We can't run. So the Bible is saying a person could decide to be a saint, set apart, sanctified, committed to what God wants them to do. But guess what? They can't outrun Satan. So you have to have a person who's just not a teacher, but a pastor. You know, when you prepare a message, it's not something you just communicate. It's something you pray about. It's not just something when you're preaching it, you hope it did good. No, it's something when you're preaching it, you hope the Spirit of God used it to touch a life so that what the God can do with that and drawing us closer to him will be achieved. I think what God misses the most is that fellowship with Adam and Eve in that garden. And that's what he's trying to reestablish is to fellowship with us, to walk with us, to talk with us, to have his children to be a part of all that he wants to do, that he's planned to do for eternity. He wants to recreate what took place in the garden by letting us experience from eating from the tree of life, we have life eternal. He wants his children to enjoy that fellowship, that friendship. So let that picture drive each and every one of us each day as we serve him, as we walk with him, as we pray to him, and as we live for him. Stay focused.